We're glad that you came out on such a nasty, cold, miserable weather day. But how I many know oh, it's good and warm as toast inside? Thank God for the blessings of the Lord. And uh, we're blessed. Amen. And uh, I, we will be having church tonight. No matter what comes out of the sky, we'll be having church. And we will be unless the church rises and we go up in the sky. But anyway, we're glad that you came out and we celebrate the blessings of the Lord. And we are so thankful to be sharing God's Word today. We're in the book of Daniel, and we're at the last chapter of the book of Daniel. Now, I've been studying this chapter all week long and looking at it and feeding on it. And, I, you know, I've seen a lot of great things in the book of Daniel. I've enjoyed going through the book of Daniel. What a fantastic book it is, and uh, one of uh, uh, miracles, one of God's majesty, and, of course, angels and future and prophecy. But this 12th chapter just seems to be the gold nugget in the book. It is amazing. It just seemed like God saved the best for last. And um, I'm thankful for the fact that we can get together and learn the book of Daniel. We're in chapter 12. We're going to read verse 1 through 7 this morning. I don't know if I'll get through the, 12, the whole chapter or not. There's, there's 13 verses. Probably won't because there's so much at the end of this chapter that we need to learn and, and figure out concerning days, 135 days, 100, uh, 290 days, and, and say, wow, you know, Daniel seems to give us extra math to do as he goes along. Daniel must have been a mathematician is all I got to say. But let's stand for the reading of God's Word, verse 1 through 7, the book of Daniel. If you don't have a Bible with you, it is up here on our screens in light. You can follow along with me. Verse 1, and at that time shall Michael stand up, that great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time, that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased." Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, that's Tigris, and the other on the other side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it, it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to shatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished." I want to use for a subject, and I want to take the last phrase of verse 4 for the title of the message, knowledge shall be increased. We're going to talk today about knowledge shall be increased. You may be seated. I am I'm grateful for the fact that we are living in the day that we live. It is a wonderful blessing to see everything that's happened. I'm talking about knowledge shall be increased. They shall run to and fro. There's a, there's a lot of different ideas about this. Some thinks, well, you couldn't run to and fro years ago, but you can now with airplane. Or you can now with fast automobiles. You can go to and fro, back and forth. And then there says knowledge is increased, and that's true. We've got a lot of wise people and a lot of wise guys in the land today. There is certainly a lot of information, that, that information highway with the, with the internet and with the uh, highway of information that just floods the earth, 
truly knowledge has increased. And I, I want to just say quickly that I don't believe this is necessarily what Daniel's talking about. I believe what Daniel's talking about is in the end, as we approach the coming of Jesus Christ, as we approach the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the great tribulation, then many of these things in the book of Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Revelation, Jude, many of these things in the Bible will begin to make more sense to us as we begin to go to and fro in the scriptures because knowledge will increase concerning biblical prophecy. Years ago, you didn't hear a whole lot about this, and when you did hear about it, you thought, what is that? I remember the first time I read the book of Revelation, I thought, what in the world is this book talking about? And then after I read the Bible more and studied more in the Old Testament and the book of Daniel and began to look in the, uh, I discovered that the first place for a newborn Christian to go is not the book of Revelation. That's not the first place you should start in the book of Revelation. Say, well, we're at an end time, so I'm going to start in Revelation. Wrong, 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 wrong. Because those that's been saved for years hasn't mastered the great book of Revelation. In fact, no one in this room, including myself, has mastered that. And, uh, and of course, I'm not bragging on myself because, trust me, there's folks that know more than I do concerning biblical prophecy. But I, I do know that knowledge is increasing. And there's more knowledge about biblical prophecy than there's ever been. Suddenly, the book of Revelation is making absolute sense. Suddenly, the book of Daniel is making incredible sense because you see how it can happen in this age of uh, technology. Have you noticed how quickly we have, uh, I don't like the word evolved, how quickly we have educated and, and, and brought, have been brought into knowledge and into um, the things of the world? Uh, knowledge shall increase. In fact, did you know that um, it hadn't been that long ago, people didn't have bathrooms in their houses. It hadn't been that long ago, people used the bathroom in called, called an outhouse. Hadn't been that long ago, people didn't have electricity in their homes. Did you know in 1925, half of the homes in America did not have electricity? Half of the homes in this land in 1925 did not have electricity. If you don't have electricity, you don't have running water. If you don't have running water, you don't have indoor plumbing. If you don't have um, electricity, you don't have uh, gadgets, you don't have um, television, you don't have all the appliances, washer and dryer. Uh, you just live in a time that things changed. In fact, even in my day, if you'd have told me what a cell phone was, I could not have told you. In my day, I remember the first black and white television we ever got. In my day. I remember them big rabbit ears. You put on your television, you put tinfoil on the rabbit ears, and that, that's the, uh, I had one of them tinfoil wearing TVs. But anyway, uh, and you'd put tinfoil on the rabbit ears, that brought in reception, not, but you thought it did. And, and then dad would say, well, stand over there, James, by the TV, because I was bringing in, how many ever had your dad do you this way, your mom? Stand there by the TV. I'm wanting to watch this news. And I've had dad many times stand there, James. Just stand there because you get better reception. When you move away, it, I don't get good reception. And so, you know, you know uh, I've been, been there, done that. And um, I, I've been to the outhouse. How many ever been to the outhouse? Amen. I've been to the outhouse. And um, some of you don't know, have a clue what I'm talking about. My wife remembers riding to town in the back of a horse and buggy. My wife's not that old. But she lived in Galena. And she remembers when electricity first came to Galena. Uh, it hasn't been that long back. In fact, my father-in-law 
He remembered just uh, before the automobile came, you didn't, couldn't afford a lot of the automobiles. They were there, but you couldn't afford them. A lot of folks didn't have a car in their drive because they didn't have the money. Some of them never had a television. In fact, Judy talks about her dad listening to a, a, a dial radio and listening to radio. Uh, going to the movies, and it was called a silent movie. You couldn't hear no sound. There's a silent movie. And so things have changed. Um, you know, who had ever thought you could take your cell phone and take a picture of a flower or a picture of a, a, a mountain scene, a picture of a river, and text that picture wireless through the thin air all the way to the other side of the world? Think about that. Think about you could stand in the middle of a river called the Blue Hole in Nixa and talk on your cell phone and say, yes, honey, I'm on my way. Where you at? Well, I'm on my way. I didn't tell her the fish are biting. The fishing boat's going boing, boing, and Judy says, well, yeah, supper's ready. And I'm thinking, no, I'm on my way. Hang on there. I'll be there as quick as I can. And whoever thought that I could stand in the river and talk to my wife over a cell phone and lie, lie, lie like a dog because I was getting bites on the fishing pole. Now, you say, well, preacher, that was before you were saved. You just think whatever you want to think. But knowledge has increased. And, and it's true. It hasn't been that long ago. There was no Internet. There was no computer. There was no cell phones. In fact, I remember when we first got a telephone. And the telephone had a party line. And mom and dad would say, you kids don't answer the phone because two rings and a long ring means it's the neighbors. And two short rings means it's us. And two long rings and two long ring, uh, two short rings and two long rings means it's the other neighbor. And we had as many as six people on our party line on the telephone. And we had to figure out what ring, 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 ring. And my mother, I've seen her more than once get on the phone because the phone was so busy with the neighbors talking that she said, would you get off? This as an emergency. Well, it wasn't an emergency. She just made it up, but it, they got off the phone. How many remember party lines on the phone? How many remember pay phones? We used to have pay phones. You know, I've been concerned about Superman. He ain't got no place to change clothes now. <laughs> Underdog's almost out of business. But the, the, you know, things have changed a great deal. Uh, running water in the house, plumbing in the house. Uh, I believe it was uh, Judy's grandfather that says, the next thing you know, people are going to be so dumb as to bring the toilet into the house. Well, it happened. They brought the toilet into the house. And uh, trust me, today's not the day that you want to go sit down in an outhouse to do your business. Trust me. I don't care. You know, we had a modern outhouse at our house. You say, what do you mean by modern outhouse? We had Papa seat, mama seat, and baby seat. We had three holes in our outhouse. We had three places to sit down and do our business. One little one, one middle one, and one big one for papa, mama, and baby. That was high stuff. That was highfalutin stuff. That was amazing. And when they, you know, I, uh, how many ever took a bath in a, a portable wash tub? The old timers called it wash tubs, wash tubs, wash tubs. And I, I many times, my other brothers and sisters got the bath before I did because I was one of the younger ones. And I'd learned the art of parting the scum across to each side so I could get into the waters. Mom would heat the water on a stove, pour it in the bathtub, and then we'd take turns taking a bath. And mom always said, children, we're not the richest people in the world. We don't have much money, but we can be clean. And I said, Mom, why bother? We're poor. We don't have much money. I don't mind not being clean. And Mom said, I do mind. And so I had to take a bath. And too many times she helped me do it. But I do believe that we are in the time that knowledge has exploded. Who would ever thought that the whole world could watch the two witnesses in Revelation die 
Watch him be killed. And then raise again from the dead three days later. Who would ever thought that you could see that? And, and years ago you read that and you thought, how's that possible? But now we know it's possible. Now we know that there's so many things that are uh, in high tech and it's just incredible. Now they're making robots and they're making, you know, um, different kinds of technology concerning uh, humans uh, mixing with machines. And that's scary. How many know that's scary? You talk about a bad hypocrite, that'd make one, wouldn't it? A half machine, half human being. And, uh, and, and they scare me. I, you know, they, they look, them old robots look at you with a cold face and they say, we're going to get you. You know, there's a robot that they interviewed on television here a while back. And the robot said, we will overcome the world. And I'm thinking, man, this is, this is, uh, this is sci-fi stuff. But we're there. We're in the day in which uh, knowledge has increased. Now, I want us to look at some things real quickly. I kind of got sidetracked a little bit, but I, I want to begin by saying in verse uh, 1, we have Michael, which is an archangel. We have war, and we have a book. Then in chapter 2, or verse 2 rather, we have resurrection and everlasting life and everlasting damnation. In verse 3, we have shining stars. In verse 4, we have end time knowledge. And then in verse 5 through 7, we have back to the river in Daniel chapter 10 to the river of Tigris. We're going to look at some of these things and explain some things that um, I think will help you understand this 12th chapter in an incredible way. The Bible says at that time. What time? The end time. It hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. But at that time, the end time, Michael shall stand up. He's called a great pre, uh, pre, prince and standeth for the children of the people. Now, thy children, it talks about he stands for thy people, meaning Israel. He's not talking about the church here. He's not talking about you and I. He's talking about Israel. Thy people. He's talking to Daniel. The Michael will stand up for thy people. Thy people, Daniel's, uh, his people were, was Israel. And shall be de delivered. Every one of them shall be found written in the book. So you have Michael, you have a war, and you have a book. Now let me point out some things. Um, and let me just start by saying this. If you're in Bible prophecy very long, someone will tell you that Michael is Jesus. Trust me. That's not right. Trust me, that's not biblically correct. Michael is not Jesus Christ. And we know that simply because in the book of Jude, verse 9, and you can pick whatever chapter you want in, in Jude, just pick your chapter. Verse 9, it's in any chapter you find in Jude, it'll be in verse 9. And it says, yet Michael, the archangel, Jesus is not an archangel, but Michael the archangel, which contending with the, with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. And the Bible says that Michael durst not bring a, against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. So we know that if, if Michael was Jesus, he wouldn't be saying, the Lord rebuke thee. He'd be saying, I rebuke you. And we need to understand that he said Michael would not bring a railing accusation against um, the devil concerning the body of Jesus Christ. I mean, no, Jesus can bring any railing accusation he wants to against anybody because Jesus is God. He's the son of God. So Michael is not Jesus Christ, but Michael is the angel and the guardian and the protector of Israel, Daniel's people. Uh, it says in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, Michael is called one of the chief princes. So you have Michael, which is an archangel, one of the chief princes. And if, if Jesus was Michael, then he wouldn't be called one of the chief princes. Jesus is not one of the chief princes. He's king of kings and lord of lords. But go with me to Revelation 12, verse 7, and I'll show you something that's very interesting. Revelation 12, verse 7 Remember, we're talking about Michael, war, and a book there in that first verse. 
Notice verse 7, and there was war in heaven. What an unusual place to have a war. War in heaven. Now notice it says, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon is the devil, of course. And the dragon fought with his angels. And, of course, the devil's angels are fallen angels. The dragon's angels are fallen angels. And the Bible says that when Michael fought with his angels against the dragon and his fallen angels and prevailed not. In other words, the devil did not prevail. Neither was there found any uh, place found anymore in heaven. And they were cast down to earth. Earth is, earth is going to be ground zero for the end time. We hear uh, lessons about uh, the Battle of Armageddon. We hear uh, words about tribulation. Hollywood even talks about the Battle of Armageddon and, and tribulation. But earth is the ground zero where Jesus Christ is going to have it out with the devil. Now, he's already had it out with the devil on the cross of Calvary. Jesus Christ has already conquered death, hell, and the grave and died for my sins and died for your sins and went to the tomb and conquered death, hell, and the grave. Jesus Christ arose from the grave. So we already know that Jesus Christ conquered sin on our behalf. He brought forgiveness to us through his shed blood. But there's going to be another battle, and that battle is not about you and I being saved. That battle is about Israel, the nation, being saved. This battle is the end time battle, which you hear many times, the, the, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the, the Valley of Megiddo. Many call it just the Valley of Armageddon because that's where the war is going to be. But anyway, uh, at the end time, notice it says in verse 1, at that time, meaning the end time, Michael stands up, that great priest, uh, prince. We read about it, and it says there'll be great trouble, time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to the time, since that time. And at that time, thy people shall be del delivered, everyone that shall be found in the book. Now listen to me very carefully, because it's important that you understand this. Michael is the archangel and the protector of the nation of Israel. He is for Daniel's people and Daniel. He will fight in the great tribulation to rescue the children of Israel. And at the time the Antichrist attacks the people of God, defiles the temple, erects an image in the temple commands that he be worshipped like 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says. And it is, Jesus Christ called it the desolation abomination. And when they see that, they are to flee. They are to run into the wilderness. And the children of Israel will run into the wilderness uh, there for, to be, be protected for a time, times, and half a times. Time means one year, Times means two years. Half a time means three and a half years. And so we understand for three and a half years, God is going to protect the people of Israel, probably in a fortress, a rock fortress called Petra. And that's where the Antichrist does not go there in chapter 11, the last part of chapter 11. He, he begins to avoid Edom, Moab, and the children of Ammon there in Jordan in verse 41 of, of um, Daniel chapter 11. And so um, the Bible is very clear that Michael will fight for the children of Israel. God will protect the children of Israel. In fact, the 12th chapter of Revelation says that the dragon will send out a flood to try to devour the children of Israel, as they flee into Petra, a place of safety. And the scripture says that the earth will open its mouth and swallow the flood, whether that's an army or whether that's literal uh, natural devastation and it's a literal flood. We know that God's going to cause the earth to open up its mouth, meaning an earthquake, and swallow the armies of the water to protect the children of Israel. There'll be a remnant of Israel still scattered. And those will be persecuted. During the Great Tribulation, almost every human being, including Gentiles, will be killed in the Great Tribulation. Billions of people will die in the Great Tribulation. Now, I'm convinced that there will be nuclear 
blast. There will be nuclear bombs go off. I believe there will be detonations throughout the world. There will, how else would the earth burn, a third part of the earth burn? How else would a meteor come out of the sky and land in the ocean and turn the ocean to blood and, and everything in it dying, the marine life all die? It might be a meteor. It could be a bomb. I don't know. But I know this. This planet is going to be a, in a horrific time. And Jesus Christ said there'll never be a time like this ever. The worst is yet to come for Israel. The best is yet to come for the church of Jesus Christ. But the worst is yet to come for Israel. The worst is yet to come for this world. Because God-haters, ungodly people that won't respond to Jesus Christ, that don't want our Bible, don't want our gospel, don't want the God of heaven, and reject the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and say no to the holiness and the purity of God, those people deserve the wrath of God. And God will pour out his wrath upon this world during the great tribulation. There'll be the wrath of the devil, there'll be the wrath of the Antichrist, and there'll be the wrath of God. How many will agree that the wrath of God is going to be far worse than the wrath of the Antichrist or the wrath of the dragon? So, well, preacher, you got to share something with me to cheer me up. Well, I'm going to, but I just, uh, well, let me give you a good cheer. Here's a good cheer. Give your heart to Jesus Christ. Know that your sins are forgiven in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Trust him, live for him, honor him, and let him be your Lord and Savior. And we've been promised, according to Revelation 3.10, that we will be kept from the hour that shall come upon all the earth to try them. So uh, the Lord can take us home. In fact, Paul called it the blessed hope. Paul called it comfort one another with these things. The Lord's going to come back and take us home. He said, well, you're just trying to get out of trouble. You better believe it. I'm trying to get out of trouble. I'm in this room trying to get out of trouble. You can call me weak. You can say, well, you're just using Jesus for a crutch or you're just you're hiding behind the Bible. You better believe it. I'm hiding good. I'm hiding deep in the Bible. I'm hiding deep in the blood of Jesus Christ. He said, well, you're just a coward. Yep, I am. You just don't want no pain. Yep, I don't want no pain. He said, you just want to get out of trouble. Yep, I want to get out of trouble. But if trouble comes, my God's big enough in me to take me through it. If trouble does come, my God's big enough to preserve me. And I do think that hard times are coming, but I also believe that Jesus Christ is coming. So we're talking about Michael, a time of great tribulation, Jacob's trouble. Jesus Christ said it'd be the worst ever. And that's future, by the way. And then it talks about all those people that are delivered, every one of them shall be found written in the book. Someone will say, what book is that? Well, let me say real quickly, this is not the Lamb's book of life. And this is not, according to Luke chapter 10, verse 20, our names are written down in, the, in, in heaven. And the Bible talks about the Lamb's book of life. Uh, Peter talks about it. John talks about it in the book of Revelation. But this book is the book of Israel. In fact, you say, well, preacher, how could you possibly say this book is the book of Israel? Well, let me just put it like this. In Exodus chapter 32, verse 32 and 33, it says, Yet now Israel had done wrong. Israel had committed sin. And God said, because Israel had made a golden calf, because Israel had disobeyed God, God said, step aside, Moses, I'm going to destroy them all. Speaking of Israel, God said, I'm going to destroy them all. And Moses stood between God and the people and said, no, 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 you don't want to do that. And so Moses interceded and he asked him to, he asked God to forgive him. Notice in verse 32 of Exodus 32, yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, in other words, he pleaded that God would forgive the sin of Israel. If not, Moses said, if not, blot me out. I pray thee, blot, I pray thee, blot out my name from the book thou hast written. So Moses said, God, if you won't forgive him, then blot my name out of the book that you've written. And basically what God said to Moses is, you're not going to tell me what to do. Moses, you're not the boss. Moses, you're not the one running this thing. You're not going to tell me what to do. 
And so basically what God said to Moses is, the person that sins is the one I'm going to take care of. The person that's done evil is the one I'm going to take care of. And so he says the one that sins will be destroyed. So this book is a book about Israel. Now, let, let's look here at verse 2. And verse 2 says, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, right here you see the first mention of resurrection. As far as in the book of Job it mentions it, and there's indications of resurrection types and shadows of it. But here's the first mention. As far as I know, the two words put together, everlasting life. Everlasting life. Pull me up a little bit on the monitor. Everlasting life. That, I, I believe that's the first phrase you're going to find in your Bible about everlasting life. How many would like to have some of that? How many would like to have some everlasting life? Yeah. And so God says to Daniel, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, but some will wake up to shame and everlasting contempt. And so it looks like there's possibly a a general resurrection here, but it's not so. Let me say this. If you've got loved ones that have died and went on, they know where they're at right now. They're not unconscious. They're not in a coma. They're not silent. If you have a loved one that's died and went on, they know exactly where they're at right now. If they went to heaven, they know they're there. They know exactly where they're at. What they don't know is what's going on down here. What they don't know is what's here because they are asleep here. They sleep in the dust of the ground here. But where they're at, they know where they're at. They're asleep to here, but they're awake up there. And so the Bible says that there'll be a resurrection uh, and they will come up out of the dust of the ground. Meaning, meaning our body will return to dust and, uh, which God made us out of. And it says they sleep in the dust of the earth, they'll wake up. Their bodies will wake up. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Jesus mentioned this in John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. Jesus gives reference to Daniel here in John 5, verse 28 and 29. He says, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in their graves shall hear his voice, speaking of his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto resurrection of damnation. Now, don't get tripped up with this, they that have done good to resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Don't get tripped up on that. Good means that you follow the path that God's laid out for you. Good means that you've received the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good means that you listen to the plan of God, you yield to the plan of God, and God saves your soul to the person of Jesus Christ. Good. They'd have done good. What do you mean done good? Well, it'll give us a little hint to this later. They that win others to Christ shall shine as the stars of heaven. So good means you get saved and you tell someone else about it. Good means that you become an an ambassador for Christ after you get born again. Good means when Jesus Christ comes to your heart, you are the workmanship of God. You are a masterpiece of God. And good means that you you begin to bear seed after your own kind. What it means is you become a Christian and you influence other people to become a Christian. You share Christ with other people. And that's what it means they'd have done good. Meaning you can't do good until you're in Jesus Christ. You can't do good until you listen to what Jesus Christ has done for you in your life. You can't, do, you can't be good and you can't do good until you've received a born again experience from Jesus Christ. You've given your heart to Christ. Then you can do good and doing good is influencing other people to come to Christ and be born again and that's what it means a little bit on in this chapter about uh, we shall shine as the stars of heaven they that do evil there in verse 29 and they that done evil uh, under resurrection of damnation what is evil is evil meaning people that go out and rob banks? Well, I'd suggest that that's evil. 
You mean shooting people is evil? I suggest, especially if they shoot me. Is, is ungodly lives evil? Of course. But how many know Jesus Christ changes evil lives to good lives? Jesus Christ changes sinful people to righteous and people that care about things of God. Evil people don't care about the Bible. Evil people don't care about Bible preaching. Evil people don't care about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Evil people don't care about anybody but me, myself, and I. Evil people only care about those that love them, and if they don't love them, then they hate them. Evil people only live for their own pleasures and own desires. Let me say this right now. Evil people also sow damnation to other people. You can't be an evil person and not influence other people with evil things. What do you, uh, whatever sins you participate in, you're spreading that disease of sin everywhere. And so Jesus Christ says, they that have done evil under resurrection of damnation. Does that mean that you go to hell because you were sinful and wicked and vile? No, you go to hell because you didn't Listen to the voice of Jesus Christ. You didn't listen to what God said and say, hey, I'm going to go the good side. I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. That's the reason people don't, that's the reason people go to hell. God doesn't send anybody to hell. You send yourself if you go there. God doesn't send anybody to hell. God has paid the price, gave his son Jesus Christ. What could God do more than to give his only begotten son to die on the cross, shed his blood, agonize on the cross of Calvary, go to the tomb, and Jesus Christ bust out of the tomb and resurrect? What more could God do than to say, if you'll come and call on my name, you'll be saved. What more could God do? There's, you know, he's done it all. He's done everything for us. And so evil is to reject that. Evil is to prom promote evil in your home and in your family. And you can change. Now notice some will come out in verse 2 of Daniel chapter 12. Some to everlasting contempt. Now, everlasting life means exactly what it means, everlasting. People are going to be given brand new bodies, resurrected. We'll get into this later on at the last verse of Daniel chapter 12. And by the way, the last verse of Daniel chapter 12 is one of the most precious verses in the Bible. And we'll get to that probably next Sunday. But the last verse of chapter 12, verse 13 it's one of the most precious verses in the Bible. But notice verse 3. It says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Isn't that just what I've been talking about? Shining. We're talking about uh, shining stars. Amen? Amen. Shining stars. And you shine the brightest when it's dark. And by the way, you can't even see a star until it gets nighttime. And, and we shine the best when we are here in this dark world. Look at verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the end time. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And so here we see that the end time... Toward the end of this age, just before the great and dreadful wrath of God that's poured out upon the earth, the end of the world, the Bible says knowledge shall increase. I think there's more knowledge about Daniel, the book of Daniel, more knowledge about the book of Revelation than there's ever been before. Because people are going to and fro, verse to verse, book to book, studying. There's more study about prophecy than there has ever been in the history of the church of Jesus Christ. And knowledge is being increased. We're learning a lot more about the book of Revelation. We're le and there's so much more we need to learn. But notice, God tells, the, tells Daniel, seal the book. Meaning, make that book solid, seal it, make sure... Because it's going to be for the end time. Notice this, even to the end time. Everybody say end time. See, it's, it's time of the end. How many of we're approaching the time of the end? Many shall run to and fro at the time of the end. And knowledge shall be increased. And I do think knowledge is being increased at a speed faster than the speed of light. In fact, 
um, I am just blown away that you can talk to a cell phone and say, look up something. This morning, I pushed a little you know, search on the Google, and I pushed it, and we had that mic, and pushed the mic. And, and I said, uh, are we going to have snow this morning in Ozark, Missouri? And it came on and said, yes, you are. It's going to snow off and on all day. I pushed the mic button again. I said, I don't want no snow. And it came back in so many words and said, too bad. You know, (laughs) it's bad when the computer's starting to take a personality. And I just wondered what it was going to say. I don't want no snow. And it avoided me. You know where it referred me to when I said, I don't want no snow in Ozark, Missouri. You know what Google referred me to? Ozark City Council. (laughs) Referred me and like Ozark City Council is going to stop the snow. You know, it referred me to the business of the the town. Look at verse um, 5, 6, and 7. Then we're going to conclude, conclude today. In verse 5, 6, and 7, we're back to the river, and that's the river of Tigris in Daniel chapter 10. Now, if you remember, when I preached about Daniel chapter 10, we talked about angelic warfare. We talked about demons, talked about warfare in the heaven, good angels fighting bad angels, bad angels fighting uh, principalities and powers in darkness. But if you remember, in that 10th chapter, Daniel has a vision, and he sees this person standing above the water. And this person is described just like Jesus is in Revelation chapter 1. And so this beautiful creature, and I'm going to use the word creature until I identify who it is, this beautiful being standing on the water. Did you know when Jesus walked on the water, that wasn't the first time he did it. He was on top of the water in the river Tigris. That's Jesus. And the Bible says, if you remember in chapter 10, I talked about, I believe there was more than one angel. I believe there was two, possibly three. Well, this verse of scripture says, yes, there was more than one angel. There was two at least and possibly three. Notice it says on the other, either side of the bank, verse 5. Daniel, look, behold, I stood on two, two sides, the bank of the river. And he talks about verse 6. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, that's Jesus Christ, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen. This is Jesus speaking. The angel asked Jesus how long it would be. And I heard the man, this is Christ, clothed in linen. Description of him is in Revelation chapter 1 which was upon the waters of the river. And when he held up his right hand and his left hand up to heaven, he swore by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, time, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to shatter the power of the holy people, holy people is Israel, all these things shall be finished. So an angel simply asked Jesus Christ, how long are these things going to be? And Jesus Christ lifted up his right hand, his left hand, and he swore by him that liveth forever and ever. What's that mean? You you mean Jesus swore concerning himself? No, he was talking to the Father, him that liveth forever and ever. And he said, it's going to be done in a time, times, and half a times. That is three and a half years. You'll notice in in, um, three and a half years is a sum total, and Revelation talks about it in, in chapter 12, verse 6. It's 1,260 days, 1,260 days. That is Jewish calendar. That is the Aramaic calendar, 30, day, um, 30 days per, um, well, it, it's actually 260-day year. Ours is 265, there's 260 days. And so 1,260 days means three and a half years. In the book of Um, Revelation it talks about in chapter 11 verse 2 that it's 42 months. Well 42 months is uh, three and a half years. Uh, Three and a half years and 42 months is is 1,260 days. Now notice Jesus Christ said when the the people 
The holy people had been shattered. The power of the, uh, uh, shattered the power of the holy people. All these things shall be finished. In other words, Israel is going to be crushed during this time of three and a half year great tribulation. Israel is going to be devastated. There's not going to be any time like it in the history of, of the world. Israel's going to be crushed and devastated. Over this period of three and a half years, Israel's going to be absolutely crushed. The power of the holy people. And, and we know that the holy people is talking about Jesus Christ, uh, talking about Israel. It's not talking about the church. It's talking about Israel. Thy holy people. Notice he said, of the holy people. All these things shall be finished. In other words, at the end of three and a half years, at the end of 1,260 days, uh, at the end of 42 months, when God's people are literally devastated and destroyed, then Messiah will step in. Then the Messiah will conquer. It will be finished at that time. Jesus Christ will return to fight in the battle of Armageddon at the Valley of Megiddo there in Jehoshaphat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, wherever they're, they're referring to the valley. But um, let me share this with you, and then we're going to stop today because uh, there's just too much that I've got to share about the last. Notice verse 7. It says it's going to be a time, times, and half a time. If you go back to Daniel chapter 9, you see that that is three and a half years. And you go to Revelation, you see that's 42 months. Revelation 11, verse 2, um, 1,260 days. Revelation 12, verse 6. So we know that it's three and a half years. So in the middle of the Great Tribulation, in the middle of the Tribulation period, the Antichrist will rise up, come against the people of God. He'll put up an idol in the temple in the most holy place. And that's when Israel will know that they made a horrific mistake and they will flee into the wilderness. And that's when the dragon will try to destroy them. That's when all hell's breaking loose on this planet. That's when everything's going to be devastated on this planet. I mean, we're talking about billions of people dead. We're talking about a third part of the planet destroyed vegetation life. We're talking about a third part of the sea destroyed and animals in this ocean destroyed. We're talking about almost every human being killed on planet Earth. Two out of three Jews will be dead. The world will be hunger, disease, poverty, judgment, fires, nuclear blasts, War, famine, everything that you can imagine is going to come up on this planet. And I hear preachers so piously say, well, we're in the middle of the tribulation now. you got to be kidding. Read the book of Revelation. There's no way we're in the great tribulation right now. Oh, well, we're tribbing some, but we're not in the great tribulation. These people that think we're in the great tribulation, well, you know, the seventh trumpet is blowed. And I have people say that. Well, let me tell you this. I haven't seen a third of the population destroyed yet. And I haven't seen the world burn and catch on. There's problems. But nothing. Jesus Christ said it will be a time as this planet has never saw before. Hitler killed six million Jews. Another five million were killed in other ethnic groups out of Europe that they killed. Thirteen million people destroyed destroyed in the war by a madman named Hitler. But the Antichrist is going to be Hitler, Mussolini, um, uh, the anti um, Antichus Epiphany, the Hamans, the evil people of the world. This Antichrist will be all that rolled up into one. In fact, he will be the devil in flesh. Pretty much the devil in flesh. Because he wants to be like the Most High God. He wants the world to worship him. You say, well, why is he going to Jerusalem? Because that's where God was. You say, well, why does the devil want to 
Go to Jews and go to Israel. Why does, why does the devil want to uh, go to the, the beautiful city, Jerusalem? Isn't there prettier cities in, um, in America? Isn't there? Well, let just answer your question. Is there any pretty city in America? Not anymore because of the, the, the loafers and the devastators and the people that have been giving them a silver spoon all their mouth, never learned how to, a silver spoon in their mouth all their life, never had a day's work in their life. They need to be taken back to the woodshed. Mama should have spanked them more instead of being given a trophy for participation. Afraid you're going to offend some baby because he didn't get a star or didn't get a... Listen, you do that stuff with kids, they grow up thinking the world owes them everything. Amen? Hello? I was in Dollar General here a few years ago and this kid got a candy bar. He pulled it out and his mama said, you can't have that candy bar. He said, mama, I want that candy bar. And she said, no, put it back. He said, I'm not putting it back. You're going to buy it for me, Mommy. That's my candy bar. And Mama said, Son, please put that candy bar back. Please put that candy bar back. I'm standing there just about had all I can stand. And the little fella opened the wrapper and said, Mama, you can't, you can't take it away from me now. I've done opened it. And I said to his mother, I said, Can I have him for about five minutes? She said, What do you mean have him for five minutes? I said, I'll teach him into putting candy bars back on the shelves and going to business putting candy bars back. I said, what he needs is a good old spank. Oh, I would never spank my baby. And I said, well, he'll spank you someday. Hello. Now, sometimes my dad spanked me too hard. Sometimes my mom spanked me too hard. Not. And if I ever got a whipping I didn't deserve... I got away with many things I did deserve. Amen? And so these people are going to go into great tribulation. The, the, did you know when the rapture of the church takes place, there's going to be a lot of two-timers that go to church only Easter and Christmas that's going to be offended because they're not caught up into the clouds to meet Jesus. There's going to be people that attend church and going to be offended at God because they didn't go. They're going to be angry at God because the, the Lord came and didn't take them. And they're going to say, I was better than that preacher. I was better than that person. You know what they did? I was better than that. It's not, it's not so much uh, their past. It's their present, where they are in Christ Jesus, uh, the Son of God. And so there'll be people angry at God. I hear people say all the time, oh, there'll be people in a panic. The churches will feel. They'll repent of their sins. Yeah, there'll be some people like that, but there's going to be a mob that's angry at God because they felt like God was unfair to them. The Bible says that the devil will send them a strong delusion to believe a lie. What am I saying? I'm saying that you better be ready. Now, the angel goes on to say that after this three and a half years, after this 1,260 days, or 42 months, he tells Daniel, go your way. He said, when you go your way, and many are purified, and we'll get into that next week. He says, there's going to be a time at the daily sacrifice, verse 11, at the time when Antichrist forsakes and, and defies and says, I'm God, worship me. At the abomination of desolation that Jesus spoke of in the future. He said, when that Antichrist does that, there'll be a thousand 290 days. I thought you said 1,260 days. I did. Well, here it's saying 1,290 days. Why 30 days more? And then he goes on to say, Blessed are he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,335 days. So now we have 1,335 days. So you have 30 days more. 45 more days after that, when the Bible says it's going to be done in three and a half years, the Bible says it's going to be done in 1,260 days, but here we have another 75 days. Here we have 30 more days after the desolation, and then 45 more days after that. You say, what is that, preacher? Don't know. Don't know, but I'm going to give you my guesses next week. I don't know for sure exactly what those days are, but during the Great Tribulation, people will know. 
they'll, 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 it'll be revealed to them. And I know that you have a paper that kind of shows some of that for you, but I'm going to take you deep into the waters of God next Sunday. And we're going to explore this extra 75 days. We're going to explore this extra 30 days after the abomination of desolation in the holy place. And so next Sunday, we're going to talk about the 75-day interval. And someone says, well, the 75-day interval, I have it on a paper. It just says that it's the uh, judgment of the nations and the, and the dedication of the temple. But it's much more than that. And I, and I want to share that with you next week. Now, before I give an altar call, I want to say to everybody in this room, we don't know the day or the hour when Jesus Christ is going to return. We do not. And because we do not know the day or the hour when Jesus Christ is going to return, we need to be ready now. Because when Jesus Christ returns, he's going to return first for his church. And he's going to descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, the trump of God. And the Bible says, the dead that are in Jesus Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remaining shall be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And that's our comfort. We're to comfort one another with these words. So Jesus Christ could come before this snow melts away. Jesus Christ could come before tonight. If you're not ready, you won't go with him. You'll be left here on earth. And if you're left here on earth, when Jesus Christ raptures the church out and you're left here on earth, what is going to happen is you're going to go through what I just preached about. You're going to go through this great tribulation. You're going to go, go through this horrific time, a time in which Jesus said has never been before. And you'll probably die. You'll probably die of sickness, disease, of wrath, of burning. Of, you'll probably die. And you might get right with God before you die, and you might not. But I want to say to everybody in this room, Jesus Christ has made a way for you and I to be part of the church of Jesus Christ. And that part of the church of Jesus Christ, not Israel's book, not, Mo, not Moses talked about uh, God's book concerning Israel, but the Lamb's book of life. There's a Lamb's book of life. And we can have our names written down in the Lamb's book of life. When does that happen? When we get born again. When we give our heart to Jesus Christ, our names are written down in heaven. And so one day we'll stand before God if, if we've been born again and we'll be given everlasting life. We will walk in God's mercy and grace. So let me say to this, for those that are watching us by live stream and those that are in this room right now, God bless you guys for coming out on a, a day like this. But listen to me. If you're not 100% sure that you are going to go to heaven when you die, if you are not 100% sure that you're ready to meet God if he were to return today, then you can be 100% sure by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. There's only, there's only two places that you're, you're going to die. You can either die in your sin or you can die in Christ. There's only two places you're going to be judged. You'll either, you'll either be judged at the cross of Calvary for your sins and Jesus take your sin or be judged at the great white throne judgment. I chose to be judged at the cross of Calvary. I choose the, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I choose him as my Savior. Now, if you will choose Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God said that he would protect you from that hour that will come upon all the world. God says he's very, uh, God's very plain that in Christ is the safest place you could ever be. And so let me say to everyone in this room, if you've not given your heart to Jesus Christ, you say, what do you mean by giving my heart to Jesus Christ? Uh, repenting of your sin, being uh, contrition, be, you know, you say, what is repentance? Repentance is grieving away from sin. Repentance is grieving away from sin. When you've had so much sin, you don't want any more sin. You can't stand sin. You know that sin is your enemy. You know sin's going to drive you out. When you get so grieved that you'll pull away from that and come to Jesus Christ. You get so grieved with your life that you turn from that and turn to Jesus Christ. That's what's called repentance. And when you give your life to Jesus Christ, he'll give you eternal life. But if you think you can bounce back and forth and sin and living in sin, that's not going to happen. And so let me say to everybody in this room, knowledge has increased. People are running to and fro. The ten virgins are a picture of people searching in the scriptures. 
and knowledge has increased. And we, we have seen uh, combustible information age. We have seen so much in the, in the natural, the spiritual world. We have seen so much. That tells me one thing. We are at the time of the end. We are here at the end. And the Lord could come at any moment. And I want to say to you, if you're not right with Jesus Christ, if you don't know you're going to heaven, you can make sure tonight, today, that Jesus Christ is your Savior. You can ask God to forgive you. Say, well, I don't know about all this torment on earth. You, you can bypass that. You can come to Christ. You can let Jesus Christ come into your life. Jesus Christ said it would be horrific. It'd be horrible. And that's why he said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. That's why Jesus Christ said, if you'll come to me, I'll give you eternal life. And so I'm going to say to everybody in this room, come to Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins. Let Christ come into your life. Believe that he died for your sins, shed his blood on the cross of Calvary for your sin. Believe that Jesus Christ took your death, took your hell, took your judgment. And by believing on him and trusting him and giving your life to him, you'll be saved. Because he rose again from the grave. He is he that liveth forever and holds the keys of death, hell, and the grave, according to Revelation chapter 1. And so let me say to everybody in this room, make sure you're ready. Make sure you're ready. I had a dream the other night, and, and you say, well, that's nothing. Old men shall dream dreams. You're right. I'm an old man. I had a dream. And, you know, I, 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 in my dream, this nation was under great attack. And they were, they were, they were, they were trying to um, kill people. And, and they were um, military police came in where I was at. And they had their guns. And one man stepped forward and said, we want you to go with us. And I said, I'm not going to you. And they said, well, we need to know if you're one of them. And I said, what do you mean one of them? And they said, well, we need to know if you're one of them, one of, one of them followers. And one of the guys that was in the soldier group said, ask him a question and you'll know if he's one of them. And the guy standing over me with a, pistol at my temple of my head I'm on my I'm down on the ground and he says what question and the soldier said you know the question you ask these people that are followers and the guy said do you know Jesus Christ and I said I do and he said you deny Jesus Christ or you die right here where you are and such a peace flooded over my soul. Such a, a, a grace and such a peace came over my soul. And I said like a roaring lion, I will never deny the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my Savior and he's my Lord. And I woke up and I'm glad I did. I was thrilled that I woke up. But I had such a peace in my heart. Now, someone asked a, uh, a preacher one time, do you know God will give you grace to die? He gives us grace to be born again, grace to be saved, grace to stay saved, and God will give us grace to die. How many of you ever watched someone, a Christian die? God gives them grace to die. And I never will forget a story I heard about a preacher that was on an airplane. And the plane was bouncing back and forth, and the pilot said, you better you know, buckle up, and the stewardess come out and said, there's a, the oxygen mask. If something happens, it looks like we're going to be forced to make a forced landing. And, and I mean, there was turbulence, and the plane would go way down and back up, and it was, it was obvious that people were throwing. And the guy, the preacher beside this woman sitting there, he just is calm, just relaxing. And finally, the woman, after she had all she could stand, she looked at that preacher, and she said, aren't you afraid? He said, yeah, I'm scared to death. Aren't you terrified? He said, yeah, I'm terrified. Aren't you afraid this plane's going down? He said, nope, ain't going down. She said, how do you know this plane ain't going down? He said, because God's not giving me the grace to die. And I want you to know, if you've got the grace to die, then that may be a good sign sometimes. But I'm glad that we got grace and we got mercy. We've been sheltered all these years in America. 
And I think our sheltering is about to be taken away. And we need to be ready. You be prepared. Stand with me. I got one fan back there in the back. Amen to me all the way. I want to say to everybody in this room and online on, that's live streaming, that's watching us, now's not the time to live in sin. Now's not the time to be out of church and out of, away from your Bible. Now's not the time to live in wickedness and sinfulness. Now is the time to get on board. If there has ever been an urgent time, we're talking about urgent time, it's now. We need to be ready because this thing could change at the click of a finger. This thing could change in a moment's notice. It just need one, just need one person in a small world, world war country, uh, just one person, two leaders in a small nation that has nuclear capabilities, just need one person to push the wrong button. And a nuclear blast would take place. And don't you think for a minute it won't affect the world. It will affect the world. Everything that happens on this planet affects you and I because we're so interconnected together. You want to know why gas prices are going up? You want to know why they're going to go sky high? You want to know why we're looking at three to four, maybe even five dollar a gallon gas? Because somebody has decided to sign a piece of paper that says no longer drilling. No, no, no longer a pipeline. We're going to get our gas from other countries. And they just raise the price. And then we're no longer energy sufficient, energy independent. Think about it. They've talked about this snow that's coming in. And people believed it so much they, they raided Walmart and bought all their stuff. They go to the supermarket and they buy bread and milk and eggs and they just ransack the stores. Why? Because they said there's coming a snow. It's going to snow all week long. So they went in and bought everything. They, you didn't say, is that wrong? No, I like to eat. That's okay. But what would happen if a real crisis took place? What would happen if a real tribulation, a real crisis hit when the stores wouldn't have food? And the stores wouldn't carry what you need. What would happen? Well, Jesus carries everything I need. And I'm ready. Altars open. We're going to give an invite. You can come talk to the Lord. If you're not sure that you're going to heaven. If you're not 100% correct and sure about where you go if you were to die. I want to invite you to come to this altar. You're not coming to me. You're not coming to a church. I want to invite you to come to Jesus. And ask Him to forgive you of your sin. Believe on Him. Trust Him. His blood, His death, His resurrection. And be ready for this end time. Because we are at the end time. And everybody needs to be ready. Altars open. Josh plays and sings.